All right, folks, welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the vlog. Like you saw on that thumbnail and the title, we're going to talk about forced induction, how it works, and just a broad overview of some of the pros and cons, and like I said, how it works. So if you want to get into the nitnoid detail uh, of these systems, this is not that video. If you're already, you know, super familiar with the forced induction, be it turbos or superchargers, this probably isn't for you. This is for a uh, new person getting into forced induction, wanting to know how it works, wanting to do some research to understand which, uh, you know, which one may be better for me. Now, this isn't going to get into, you know, the comparisons of the two or anything like that, but it's going to give you information on each one and kind of give you my perspective on each of these and we're going to get into it right after this intro all right folks let's get straight into it the first thing we want to talk about from a forced induction perspective we're going to talk about superchargers now there's two types of superchargers. There's positive displacement and there's centrifugal 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 superchargers. I always mess that word up and I'll continue to mess it up. So just bear with me. Let's get into the positive displacement supercharger. Things like Whipple, Magnuson, Kenny Bell, IHI. Those are the ones that are in the Hellcats, the Demons, and the Red Eyes. Those are all positive displacement superchargers, and they all work pretty much the same way, like I said, as this animation that I'm putting up now. So working from the top down, because these superchargers typically sit in place of your intake manifold. So looking at this animation, you see the blades twisting and turning at the very top of the engine. That's the positive displacement supercharger. What those fins are doing is compressing air and forcing it down into the combustion chamber, which more air, you can push more fuel. More air, move more fuel makes a bigger bang. Bigger bang makes more power. Okay, so that's basically how these positive displacement superchargers work. Now, let's talk the pros and cons of a positive displacement supercharger. I say it's a pro, it could be a con, you could look at it either way. They make their power linearly. So when you look at a curve from a dyno on a positive displacement, it's pretty much a straight line. It's not really a curve, it's a straight line and that's I guess that could be neither good or bad but that's just the way uh, they make power and what's a positive in my opinion is that it makes the power down low in the low rpm range literally from the time you hit the pedal it's making power and what that gives you is what I call the Hellcat experience and what I mean by that is you feel it right off the bat. There's no lag. Literally no lag. And these things make incredible power. That's another great thing about these. Well, all of them. These things make really good power. Be it in a Hemi, a Mustang, a Camaro, Ford F-150s with a Whipple are incredibly fast. I mean, it's amazing what these people do with, uh, with these superchargers uh, on these big V8s. And they're fairly easy to install. There's not much to them. They're kind of, you know, in one big box and takes the place of your intake manifold and maybe a few other things to, uh, to route stuff uh, and, and you're done. So it's not rocket science. So some of the negatives, so the cons to these, they make an extreme amount of heat. I don't know if you've ever touched 
the top of one of these things after someone makes a run down the quarter mile, but they are extremely hot. Now, what's missing out of this and the turbo uh, animation as well, what's missing out of there is an intercooler. So that's how they take care of some of that heat is through an intercooler, be it an air to air or air to water intercooler. And that may be another video is talking about air to air and air to water uh, intercoolers. We may talk about those later, but back to the cons of the positive displacement. The second one is, is it uses power to make power. And what I mean by that, if you look back at the animation, it's using the crank pulley to turn its pulley to, to compress that air. So you are losing some parasitic loss to make power. All right. So that's positive displacement in a nutshell. Let's talk about the second type of supercharger and that's centrifugal. All right. So these are things like pro chargers, things like Vorte. Okay. So a lot of people consider pro tech, uh, pro charger, the, the centrifugal only centrifugal supercharger out there. They're not. There's a couple couple more manufacturers, Hamburger being one of them, Vortec, and some others. But Procharger is not the only one out there. Now, these things work a lot like turbos. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up the turbo animation and kind of tweak it to these centrifugal superchargers. So let's put that up right here. All right. So the air comes in through the... Comes in through the so the air comes in through the air filter and you can see on the back side of that turbo the exhaust gases are what spins that turbo so that's a turbo a centrifugal supercharger is much like a positive displacement supercharger and where the crank turns uh the turbines on a centrifugal supercharger so that's the big difference so let me Take that away now so we don't get confused. So these things make great power here. Let's go, let's go pros and oh well, let's go to, to the dyno sheet. Now this will look more like a curve because they make power exponentially and it continues as long as you can make RPMs, they're gonna make more and more power. That's just the way they work. As long as you, you don't overspin it. You can make power on top of power on top of power. You rev to 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 RPMs. It's just going to create more and more boost. Okay. So pros is one of it is that exponential power on the top end, right? We talked about that. Some people don't like this, this, this term that I'm about to use is you can drive your car like it's stock. It's much easier. So if you stay below 3,000, 3,500 uh, RPM range, you're pretty much driving your car as it's stock. Now, yes, it's still turning. It's still uh, creating vacuum at that point. But your car drives much like stock, where with the positive displacement, it's a little bit harder. You can still drive it like it's stock. It's just a little bit harder. You got to be a little more careful on the gas, but it's much easier to drive like it's stock. And these are fairly easy to install. There is a tad bit more that goes into it than it does for the positive displacement superchargers, but they are fairly easy to install. And like I said, they make great power just like all of these do. Uh, the cons, there is that little bit of spool time. And there's ways to mitigate that, but I'm just saying straight out, straight out the box, there's some spool time. And what, I'm, what I mean by that is that it, the power doesn't come in until that 3,000, 3,500 RPM range. So you got the lag time to get up to that, those RPMs for the centrifugal to start making power. Okay. But when that power comes in, it comes in hard and you know it. Okay. Trust me. I have a pro charger on my car. I daily my car and I race my car. And that when that pro charger starts spinning, you know it 100%. When it starts making boost, 
it makes boost fast. And so that's another one. Power comes in at the higher RPM range, right? And it also uses power to make power exactly like the positive displacement superchargers do as well. Because it's run off a belt that comes off the crank. So you lose some parasitic loss to make much, much more power in the overall scheme of things. All right. So that gets us through superchargers. Let's move on to turbos. The turbos, there's a gazillion makers of turbos out there. Just some of the top of the line, more, most often used kind of turbos. You look at Precision. You look at Garrett. You look at Comp. And like I said, there's a, there's a lot of other manufacturers out there that make great turbos as well. These are just a couple um, to give you an example. All right. So how a turbo makes power. We're going to toss up. We're going to toss back up the animation that I used for the centrifugal supercharger. And this time it is 100% true. So as you can see, as the pistons are making exhaust, that exhaust goes to the back side of the turbo, begins to spin the turbo, which then sucks air, ambient air in through the air filter and pushes it into a uh, combustion chamber. Again, intercoolers are always used with these things to cool down the air, to put, which then makes the air more dense so you can shove more air in there, more air, means you can use more fuel, which means a bigger bang, which makes more power. All right, but that's the basic design of how a turbo works. All right, so now we know how they make power. So let's break it down. There are two types of turbos that are out there. There are oiled that use the vehicle's oil to lubricate them, and then there are oilless ones that take grease to go ahead and lubricate those those turbos but you don't use your car's oil and we'll get to the pros and cons of that here in a minute we're going to talk each one of these and then we'll talk about the pros and cons uh, overall oil turbos pros you can put them anywhere you can put them on top of the engine you can put them underneath the engine um you can put them in front of the engine. You can put them in the trunk. You can put a turbo anywhere. Okay. The problem becomes how do you, one, keep it cool, and two, how do you keep it lubricated? Okay. So with oiled turbos, one of the cons is uh, you're going to have to tap into your, your oil pan so that way you have a feed and return to go ahead and, and oil your turbos. Now, if your turbo is mounted on top of the engine, which a lot of people do, you don't necessarily need a scavenging pump. And what a scavenging pump does is pulls the oil from the turbo and pushes it back into the car so it gets makes that cycle. So it goes from the car to the turbo, from the turbo back to the car, and makes that circle to keep the turbo lubricated. Now, the problem really becomes is when you stick them underneath your car. When you stick them underneath your car, you absolutely have to have a scavenging pump to keep those turbos oiled. Me, this is just me. That's one more piece of equipment that can go can go bad and if it goes bad especially if you have them underneath your car if that scavenging pump goes bad your turbos are going to go real quick <laughs> right behind it so just keep that in mind it is there's one more piece of equipment in the middle uh, that can mess things up now you don't hear it very often but i'm just saying it's there it's there and it's an issue and like I said, you have to drill into your oil pan. So now let's talk about oil-less turbos. Oil-less turbos, you can stick them anywhere as well. On top, underneath, in the trunk, in the roof. 
you can stick them in the passenger seat, wherever you want to stick a turbo, you can stick a turbo. The only difference is you don't have to worry about the scavenging pump. You don't have to worry about drilling into your oil pan. You don't have to worry about return lines or feed lines, any of that. This is one self-contained, self-lubricating uh, piece of equipment. All you have to do is obviously replace that grease every three to 5,000 miles, depending how much use you use, you know, how, how many times you go to the track, how many times you're in boost, how long you're in boost and all of that goes into that calculation. But they say every three to 5,000 miles, you need to re to uh, regrease those turbos. All right. So there's the two turbos. They make great power exponential power just much like the centrifugal supercharger so if you look at a at a turbo dyno graph it's a it's it, it's a curve not a straight line it's a curve and it continues to curve up 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 and up you can make exponential power from a turbo as long as you can make uh, rpms and exhaust you can make more power um and also you can drive these like stock too because of the the lag that comes with turbos and where that comes in is you got to make it enough exhaust to start spinning those turbos so until you make uh, enough pressure with your exhaust um your your turbo will just won't be making boost it'll just be spinning okay so you can drive livestock cons spool time now there's ways to deal with spool time. I know you turbo guys are going to go nuts in the comments. There's ways to deal with spool up time, but out of the box, turbos have lag time. And that, like I said, that's the time to begin uh, creating enough exhaust pressure to spin the turbo for the turbo to make boost. Okay. And there can be some additional maintenance and additional things to keep an eye on. Okay, and that's, um, you know, like I said, the oil part of things and then the greasing part of things for the oilless turbos. All right, folks. So there you go. Basic high level view of forced induction superchargers and turbos. Let me know what y'all think in the comments. If you are stopping in for the first time, hey, check out the rest of the channel. If you like what's going on. Do me a couple things. Subscribe and like those videos. It doesn't cost you anything. It's a freebie. And it'll help out the channel quite a bit. I appreciate y'all watching these videos. I appreciate y'all, you know, watching through those ads. Even if you skip them, I highly appreciate you. Uh, each and every one of you that, that, do, that do do that. But take that two seconds, hit the subscribe, and hit that like. That's going to do it for this one, folks. Till next time. Adios.